Now, you know, every time we sing a song like that, I remind you, you're making a promise to God. As you sing those words, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Do you really mean that you're going to live every moment of the rest of your life for Jesus Christ? <laughs> Remember, as you sing the hymns, and I know I pull that on you every now and then, but as you sing the hymns, you are making God a promise when you sing that kind of a hymn. And he expects you to keep your promises. And so I trust that you will. Tonight we have the great privilege of having Dr. Don Boys with us, former state senator, author of many books, newspaper columnist. Those of you who get his uh, emails on the internet uh, know that he writes some really incredible, not only uh, insightful, but also many times very humorous uh, articles. And I trust that tonight you will sign up for it if you haven't done it already. Uh, you will enjoy him immensely. And he's going to do another introduction of some other person here in a moment and tell you a little bit about his books. Dr. Boyce. God bless. Thank you, Dr. Spencer. It's a joy to be here. I mean, it's a delight to be here. And uh, I need to ask you, if you're interested in receiving our column, I, my column goes out all media, you know, the, tele, the talk shows, radio, TV, newspapers, and so forth. And uh, uh, if you would like to get it, it'll come weekly and uh, we're glad to send it to you. We're also giving away an e-copy of one of my books. And that's uh, if you have a computer or a Nook or a Kindle or whatever, uh, you can read my books. They're, they're $10 on, at Amazon.com, but, but we'll give it to you if you, uh, if you just give my wife, uh, your, my wife your email. You've got to do it. Um, I'm in my, or I'm starting my 65th year of preaching. I started preaching on the street corners of Huntington, West Virginia. And uh, so I've been a lot of places, Africa and Australia and Europe many, and Orient. So I've been in a lot of churches, small and large, all kinds. And it's a delight to be here. I, this church, you don't have any idea, but this church has impacted my life and my ministry since I was 16 years old. And, uh, you know, I told the pastor the next couple of days, usually we have no idea of the people we reach and the and people we impact. We know some, but... Uh, just a word sometime in a gospel track handed out or a radio or TV t telecast the impact that we're making or the money that you send to missions and uh, but I was a street preacher just saved and I heard Dr. McIntyre he came to Huntington for a couple three nights in one of the city hall or something don't remember where but I, I was at a good American Baptist church I say a good American Baptist church this was 1950 whatever 50 uh, one maybe and uh, but it was an American Baptist church but it was a good American Baptist church good pastor and uh, in fact the pastor had me preach for him I'd been on the street corners and the missions and the, and the jails for the previous year or two and now I got to hit the big time and preach in our church and then Carl McIntyre came to town and I heard for the first time about the corruption of the American Baptist Convention it had been in my mind that denominations the churches would be corrupted and then their association with the communists and the National Council of Churches and that man his preaching and his exposure changed my life there's no question it's I may, I may have gone on to an American Baptist College or something who knows uh, but uh, I've talked about him and I've written in, in recent years I've written about him uh, this ministry really impacted my life and so this is the first time I've been able to tell you thanks. Uh, and uh, I believe that if nothing else, it, it made me research. I lost some naivete. I, I became uh, more aware of what was going on and then did my own research, made my own mind, became as independent as a hog on ice. And uh, it changed my life, changed my ministry. So thank you all and for this church. Um, my my books uh, last the year I've had three books published, and uh, the one that this last or last couple of weeks is uh, Muslim invasion, the fuse is burning. Uh, I've been called a hater and a bigot and and a scaremonger, fearmonger, uh, but the facts are there. You make up your mind. Uh, I I probably know about the Quran than a lot of Muslims do, and. If, 
In fact, what many Muslims know about the Koran is like many Christians. It would fit into the navel of a flea. They don't, don't know too much. But anyway, that book will shock you, I think, somewhat. And then this book, Evolution, published a couple months ago, Evolution, Fact, Fraud, or Faith. And this one, The God Haters, was published about, about a year ago. And it deals with the atheists and their plans to make it uh, illegal for any pastor or parent to teach a child about hell or an exclusive way of salvation. And then this one is Islam, America's Trojan Horse. This was written a few years ago. A lot of good books out about Islam. Mine's the only one that deals with the black Muslims. Uh, what are they? How, how are they ex accepted or respected or rejected uh, by uh, traditional Islam? Plus many other chapters that deal with the mistakes in the Quran and Hadith and so forth. So see my and plus got a book on humor, a book on health, a book on political issues, a book on AIDS. Uh, about 11 books, about $200 worth of books. We sell them for the package for $95, or individually they're discounted also. So anyway, see her if you're interested. But don't forget, if you want the free ebook, see her and uh, give her your email address. Ellen is uh, my editor. She keeps me out of a lot of trouble. I just noticed a column that just went out. She missed a word. I was talking about homosexuality, how it's abominable and uh, abnormal and something uh, aberrational. And there's a word in there that's not a word. And that's that. I guess it's a, I don't know if it's a self correcting or whatever. Anyway, uh, she missed it. So I'm going to dock her pay or something. Uh, she keeps me out of a lot of trouble. She really does. And uh, keeps me on focus. We've been married now 28, 28 years. And I was married for 33 years to a great lady. We had four children. And they're all in Christian ministry today. My son's a pastor in Houston. And my daughters are all Christian school teachers. And. Uh, my wife died back in 87, and I had no intentions of getting married again. Ellen uh, was married just out when she was in Bible college in Winston-Salem, Piedmont, at Piedmont Baptist College. And her husband got sick. They were going to the mission field, and he died the morning of college graduation. And they had a little girl. And then about five, six, five years later, she came to Chattanooga, where we, near where we live now, and met a man. He had come down from Indiana with his wife and two boys, and uh, uh, his, wife was, his wife was killed in a car wreck. And he and Ellen met and got married, and he finished Tennessee Temple University and managed to, and he got sick the last year of school, managed to walk down the aisle to get his degree with a couple of hundred other students, and uh, the next day went to the hospital, diagnosed with uh, bone cancer, and he died exactly one year later, the week of college graduation. So we met, had a great, incredible romance, uh, old-fashioned uh, storybook romance, and uh, she chased me, I mean, she uh, uh, finally agreed to marry me, and uh, that was 28 years ago. Well, you're, you're rushing me, dear. Uh, so I was, uh, I'm her third husband, and I hope I'm her last husband. I know this, I'm not going back to college, that's for sure. But. Uh, but anyway, she's going to come and sing. She sings a cappella and uh, does a great job. I, I, I'm fearful. And she sung to thousands of people. I'm fearful that she'll get off on the wrong note. And uh, But I, I don't think it'll really bother that much because it's a minister. Sweetheart. I was 13 years old the first time I remember hearing a clear presentation of the gospel. The preacher's text was John chapter 3, verses 14 through 16, where Jesus taught Nicodemus. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I still remember the mental picture that I had that night of Christ lifted up on the cross for me. I realized that Jesus Christ paid the debt for my sins, and I trusted him that night as my personal Savior. <clears throat> I never knew about his suffering for me, never knew the price he paid to save. 
set me free until I heard the words for God so loved the world of sinful men that he gave his only son on Calvary he looked down and saw my misery and pain he saw all that I had done to cause him shame but when I trusted in the blood he shed to save me from my sin he reached down and touched me I was born again oh, oh, it broke my heart when I saw Calvary when I felt the nails as they pierced his hands when I stood and watched his face as they nailed him in my place oh how it broke my heart to understand now sometimes my heart is lifted up with pride and my importance is the big thing on my mind but <clears throat> When I forget the place he found me or the pit he dug me from, then it's time to take a walk up Calvary. Lord, let me walk with you while you climb Calvary let me feel the nails again as they pierced your hands let me stand and watch your face as they nailed you in my place Lord, break my heart again. Show me Calvary. Now my Lord is seated next to God in heaven where he pleads my cause and intercedes for me but i just know someday i'll get to walk beside him down the streets of gold because of calvary and it should break your heart when you see Calvary, when you feel the nails as they pierced his hands, when you stand and watch his face as they nailed him in your place 
just to save you by his grace then you'll understand Calvary. Thank you, dear. Thank you, dear. Let's pray. Our Father, now thank you for Christ. I thank you for the privilege of ser- of being saved and the privilege of serving, serving the Lord. Thank you for the, uh, uh, with salvation comes a purpose for living. And uh, thank you for these folk who are here. Thank you for their great history and uh, tradition. I thank you for that. And I thank you again what what they have meant to me. And I pray, Father, that you would bless in this service tonight. It's not my service. It's your service. And I pray that you'd be honored in everything that's said. Thank you for already the music, great hymns of the faith that express our love and appreciation of what we believe. And thank you for that. And uh, so help us to be effective servants and uh, realize that one of these days we're going to stand before you and give an account of how we've served and, and why we've served. So bless us according to your own will and, and use this service to honor Christ. In his name I pray. Amen. Dates about 600 B.C. in the city of Jerusalem. I see a teenager as he bounces up some stairs to an upstairs chamber where he plans to spend the day studying. He's done this many, many days before. His tutor awaits him, and that young man enters that chamber, begins studying, and that young fellow has royal blood flowing through his veins. One day his family expects him one day to sit on a throne because he has royal blood in his veins. But this day is going to change everything. In fact, this young man will never sit on a throne, but he'll sit next to some thrones and probably impact more lives than about any king that's ever lived. But he doesn't know that. He goes to that room, sits down, begins to work, and like many young people, he found it rather boring, and after a while, he was losing some interest, and then he heard some strange noises coming through an open window. As soon as he cocked his head toward the open window, and then goes over and looks out that window, and he sees to his horror that the giant war machine of Nebuchadnezzar is covering the mountainsides around Jerusalem. He watches from that window as foreign troops run amok through the city streets. He sees them as they rape, as they burn, as they destroy. He sees his city go up in flames, his family taken. In the early afternoon, that young man is a prisoner of war. His life has totally changed. He's outside the city. Rough soldiers are tying his hands together. They put a rope around his neck. The other end of the rope is tied to the wagon train. In that wagon train are the sacred vessels stolen from the house of God. Everything of value has been taken from Jerusalem. The city is in flames, black smoke hanging over the city. That young man is not used to such rough rough treatment as they push him around. And and finally he feels a tug on his neck and he gets the message he's going to be dragged 500 miles through the desert unless he keeps up with that wagon train. And I see him as he makes his way and he's choking on the dust. He thinks about mom and dad and wonders about friends and what in the world is going to happen. What's going to happen to him and what's going to happen to the people left behind, the people who have been killed. And I see him as he turns around, gets his last look at Jerusalem, home. And he sees this burning city and he looks at, made at the gates, he can see his grandmother as she stands there and, and waves a handkerchief. And she yells, Goodbye, Grandma! We love your son! Do that! And Grandma thinks maybe she'll see her grandson in the next few months, but prisoner chains or ransom or whatever, but Mama's wrong. Grandma's wrong. For young Daniel is destined to spend the rest of his life in wild, wicked, worldly Babylon. Makes his way behind that wagon train to come to an oasis later in the afternoon. Stop. He's given something to eat and drink. He's tied up to a palm tree. And I see Daniel as he sits there and makes fists behind his back. And he thinks about that morning, how his life has changed as he got up that morning. And he, he has no idea what awaits him. I hear him as he says something like, God, I'll not forget my heritage. I'll not forget what I, my culture. I'll not forget what I was taught by the man of God and what my parents taught me. I'm not going to forget my language. I'll not forget the good things. I'll not forget the principles I was taught. And I see him as he finally gets to sleep. Waking the next morning, he's given something to eat and drink, and he's tied back to the wagon train. They move north, and finally, they see the city of Babylon in the distance. Babylon, the most magnificent city on the face of the earth. First city in all history to, to have 200,000 population. Magnificent walls. 
Walls as high as a football field is long. Astounding, astounding city. It was considered impossible to conquer, absolutely impossible to conquer. He makes his way through the main gate and he sees people there from all over the known world. And he was a, an educated young man, but he wasn't ready for what he saw. Made his way on down through the streets, following that wagon train, still tied like, a, like an animal. But the big surprise he got was he wasn't taken to prison. Instead, he was taken to the palace. And there he was released, given something to eat and drink. And then he had a meeting with one of the administrators who said to Daniel and his friends, after three years of training, you young men are going to receive a high political appointment in the administration of Nebuchadnezzar. And I hear Daniel as he says something like, now wait a minute here, I must have misunderstood something. Something was lost in the translation. Are you telling me that you all specifically chose us to work in the administration of this pagan king Nebuchadnezzar? And are you telling me that after we learn the language and we learn the customs and the procedures and we fit into the administration that we're going to receive a high political office and we're going to snap our fingers and even Babylonians are going to jump and we're going to put our name to documents that could change lives? Even Babylonians? Are you telling me that we're going to have a beautiful home, a summer home, maybe a winter home? And we're going to have um, nice chariots, spoke wheels, a little chrome along the side, and white high-stepping high horses? Is that what you're trying to tell us? And they said, Daniel, this is exactly what we're trying to tell you. And Daniel, just a teenager, maybe 15 or 16 years old, knew there was more danger in po popularity and position and possessions than in pri privation. And I see him in verse 8 of chapter 1. I think the secret to Daniel's long and successful life. It says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank. And I believe that's the secret. Daniel purposed in his heart. I believe few people amount to anything unless they purpose to amount to something. I believe it seldom happens accidentally. Daniel purposed that he wouldn't be defiled, wouldn't be deficient, wouldn't be defeated. All the wine and all the meals that were produced at that time in Babylon were sacrificed to idols. At this time, there were about 65,000 pagan gods that the Babylonians worshipped. And so when they would prepare a meal, they would offer it to these, one of these false gods. And now, some of this food is brought over to Daniel and his friends. And Daniel said, I can't eat this food. And probably one of his other friends said, Daniel, what are you talking about? Of course you can. I mean, first of all, we don't want to antagonize the king. And we've had long journeys, and we've lost some weight on this long trip to, uh, to Babylon from our home in Jerusalem. Daniel said, no, I can't eat it. First of all, it's forbidden by, most of it's forbidden by the Levitical Code. But Daniel, we're 500 miles from home, and the preacher isn't here. And mom and daddy aren't here. Daniel said, I can't eat it. It's been forbidden by the, the Levitical Code. Plus, it's been offered to idols. And while we know there's no such thing as these idol gods, if I partake of this food, people will think that that's, I'm giving a nod of recommendation toward those false gods. No, maybe an extremist position, but I'm going to be safe. I'm not going to eat it. I'm not going to be defiled. Daniel wasn't defiled. Satan is determined to defile you and me. He'll do what he can to defile us. He'll, he wants to defile us as to our principles. A principle is a foundation of truth on which other truths are based. And Daniel took the Ten Commandments into captivity with him. Not the stone tablets, but the truths. It was wrong to lie in Jerusalem and also wrong to lie in Babylon. It was wrong to commit adultery in Jerusalem and also wrong to commit adultery in Babylon. Time and the place had nothing to do with the principle involved. And Daniel lived for God in Babylon all his life because he lived for God in Jerusalem. Folks, the Bible is the only safe, solid, secure foundation upon which we can stand. If we stand on anything else, we're standing on sinking sand and standing on a bridge of mist. We need to have our lives controlled by the principles of the Word of God. It may be difficult sometimes, but that's irrelevant with the cost. We do what's right. In 1662, England passed the uh, Act of Conformity, called the 1662 Act of Conformity. And what it was, it was a requirement that every preacher, first of all, every preacher in the country had to be a member of the Church of England. 
And all these members of the Church of England had to conform to the newly revised Book of Common Prayer. And a lot of, a lot of the objection to it. And over, over 2,000 of Church of England, these weren't independent Baptists or independent Presbyterians, these people were Church of England people. And over 2,000 of them refused to obey the king. They could pray, hey, it's a law. We're supposed to obey the law. We'll go along with it. But they knew it was wrong. And over 2,000 preachers in the Church of England went to jail and were exiled. And uh, all, all of them lost their pulpits and their income. I wonder if that comparable thing would happen today. How many preachers would really take such a principled stand? They did. Because they were based, their lives were based upon principles. They weren't defiled. You and I are not to be defiled as to our principles or as to our precepts. Precepts are code of conduct, and they're based on our principles. Everyone has a code of conduct. Even lost people have a code of conduct. Uh, uneducated Christians, undedicated Christians have a code of conduct. Just some are more refined and defined than others. A man says, uh, I'll never be unfaithful to my wife. Can you imagine how that would change the world? Just that simple thing. Not getting saved. And not believing and practicing the Bible, just one principle. I'll never be unfaithful to my wife. It would totally change society. And everybody ought to live that way whether they're saved or not. Another man says, well, I'll never be unfaithful to my wife. Oh, this is with that woman down the street there. That's also a code of conduct. Not much, but it is a code of conduct. Mickey Cohen was a gangster. He, in fact, he was the gangster. Head of, all, head of the mob in Los Angeles in the 40s and the early 50s. He was a Jew, and he got involved with Billy Graham during Graham's greatest meeting he ever held, in my opinion, his 10th crusade in Los Angeles, 49. And uh, Graham tried to win him, and he, he didn't. He danced all around it. Remember, he, he was in charge of all the rackets in Los Angeles, all the prostitution, the policy, everything, and gambling and so forth. And... Uh, he, Graham finally got weary, didn't have time to deal with him, and he had a car dealer, a rich car dealer who was a Christian, to try to win him and, and deal with him and answer his questions and prod him. And the guy, they remember, he lives in a huge mansion and he's the number one mobster in Los Angeles. And uh, the, the gangster told this guy was, that was trying to press him to get saved and told him to have a total change of life. And Mickey, you don't want to go on the rest of your life killing people and having people trying to assassinate you. You don't want to do that way. And here's what he said. He said, look, he said, I've been in the mob all my life since, since I was a kid on the streets. And he said, I never killed anybody that didn't deserve killing. And he said, uh, he said, you talk about me want to be a Christian and, and, turn, and turn my back on the, all the rackets and all. He said, look, there are Christian ball players and there are Christian businessmen. Why can't there be Christian gangsters? That shows you his lack of principles. It's a precept based on work principles, but that's the way it is with many people today. Daniel said, I'm not going to be defiled as to my precepts. And of course, we're not to be defiled as to our practices. Our practices are based on our precepts. Precepts are based upon our principles. In the state of Missouri, there was a legislator who was took a bribe for $25,000 to vote a certain way on a particular bill. And then he received a $50,000 bribe to vote the other way. Not too bright, but then nobody said legislators were very bright. And, uh, and of course, he came out. Here he is now on trial. And the uh, prosecuting attorney asked him, he said, why was it he returned, he returned the $25,000 bribe, the first bribe he got? He said, why did you return that? And he raised himself up to his fullest stature and he said, well, I'll have you know that I'm too conscientious to take money from both sides. I'll take money from one. I'll take a bribe from one side, but not both sides. You see, warped sense of values, his precepts and his principles. Daniel said, I'm not going to be defiled as to my practices. He was a practicing Jew living in Babylon, 500 miles away from, from Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar knew Daniel was a uh, man dedicated to his Jewish religion and he knew that he wouldn't do what he told him to do in, 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 uh, in disobedience to God so he tried to court him and he said, well, food and good things 
and he changed Daniel's name, but he couldn't change his nature. Big difference. He changed his clothing, but he couldn't change his character. Changed his address, for sure, but didn't change his attitude. Daniel was a young man. And folks, usually we think that wisdom and character comes only with older people. But if young people are trained correctly, they can have character also. And they can exercise wisdom, character, and courage the way Daniel did. Daniel said, I'm not going to be defiled. And he wasn't. He said, also, I'm not going to be deficient. I'm not going to be deficient in my duties. In uh, chapter 2, verse 48, you see the duties of, of uh, Daniel. And it's absolutely amazing. Remember, he's a hated Jew, and he's just a young man. By this time, he couldn't be more than maybe 19, 20 years of age. And it says in verse 48, Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. That's an astounding thing for a young Jew. Daniel said, I'm not going to be defeated in my work. Uh, in verse 20 of chapter 1, the Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar looked at Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and compared them, did a study, compared them with all the other politicians working for him, and it says that they were ten times better than all the others. I'd read the Bible through numerous times and never noticed that. This is not hyperbole. This is, uh, ten means ten. No indication that's symbolic at all. Daniel and his friends, young Jews, young people, did a better job, were more conscientious, were uh, on time and put out better work and could be counted upon more so ten times better than all the other Chaldeans that worked in the Babylonian Empire. Astounding statement. We're not to be defeated in our work. If you're a salesman, if you're a teacher, lawyer, clerk, farmer, you ought to do the best job you can do. And too often I find that people blame Christ for their lack of success. Well, I could never get to be president of the firm because I'm an active, born-again, committed Christian. Sometimes there will be some part persecution and some difficulty. We know that. But too often, folks, that's a cop-out. And I've discovered out there they're interested in one thing, and that is to get a quality job done for the least overhead. And if you can produce, I believe you'll be president of the firm or you'll be top salesman or whatever. And I think people, Christians, ought to go as far as they can, make as much money as they can, uh, give away as much as they can, as long as it doesn't hinder their service for Christ and hinder their family. We're, we're to be, not to be defeated in our work, not to be defeated in our worship. Uh, we are to be people who are faithful to the Lord. We're to keep our word. We are to be people to be looked up to. To when we work, we do a superior job. We are to not to be deficient in our duties and, and not to be defeated. Daniel, remember, in the uh, sixth chapter of Daniel, uh, now he is number three man in the Medo-Persian Empire. Now, he lived for God most all of his adult life in the Babylonian Empire under Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. Here he is now, Prime Minister of the Medo-Persian, the greatest empire ever existed at this time, Re reached the greatest distances. And they recognized, even though he was an 80 year, 85 year old dude, they recognized his ability. And he had this high position. And he had some enemies. We are known by our enemies as well as our friends. And so they came after him. They wanted to get him. But they said, we, we can't find anything wrong with this dude. Now, if they lived with him, they know, would have known that Daniel wasn't perfect. But they couldn't find the cause to place against him. And finally, they said, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's get a law passed that says you can't pray. Because, you see, they knew that Daniel prayed three times a day. And let's make it so that you lose your life if you disobey that law. These people could count on Daniel. They knew that Daniel was committed and would not be unfaithful to his duties. He would not be defeated in his service. And so Daniel drove home one afternoon after the law had been promulgated. It was now illegal to pray all over the empire. Couldn't ask anything of any God, anybody, any God, of the many gods that existed, pagan gods. Couldn't ask anything of anybody except the king. And Daniel drives up at his big mansion, 
and he sees that the sundial, it's time to pray. Hold it. There's a federal law now that says you can't pray. And surely he's got to be aware of this and he has to be careful because people are looking to him. I mean, he's in a high position. I mean, after all, if he loses his position, who knows who's going to get take his place? Daniel at least knows he's honest in treating people fairly. I see him as he goes up to his room, as he had done before, the Bible says. And he opens the window, he, the drapes, and he looks across the desert, and 500 miles away, he can see Jerusalem, when he was taken away as a, as a teenager. And he sees his enemies down in the bushes, taking notes, so they can testify against him in court. Now Daniel knows, here I am. He says, I've prayed all my life since I've lived here. I've prayed three times a day as I face Jerusalem. He didn't have to face Jerusalem. He didn't have to be in an open window either. He could have played around with this thing and got out of the out of the quandary. But Daniel said, no, that's a capitulation to evil. It's taking the cowardly way out. I'm not going to do it. And he got on his knees in that window knowing his enemies were there taking notes. And he prayed. And they had what they wanted. And they testified against him in court. He was found guilty and sentenced to die. Now, in those days, they carried out the death penalty by throwing the culprits, the criminals, to wild animals and been starved. And so they threw him into the den of lions. Not just the lions, lions' den. There's a big difference in a lion's den and a den of lions. And yet God closed the mouths of the lions. And Daniel slept peacefully that night while the king, who was a friend of Daniel's, walked the floors because he knew that Daniel would be devoured by the, the lions. Daniel was first member, of, a charter member of the first Lions Club. And uh, but when the king came the next morning, he found that Daniel was alive. And said, Daniel! And he knew that God had, his, Daniel's God, had protected him and closed the mouths of Leo and the other lions. They wanted to get Daniel, and Daniel showed his devotion to high principle because he had been taught that, and he had made a he had made a commitment to live for God. We show our devotion by how we love. Modernists talk a great deal about love, but it's a silly, syrupy, uh, fundamentalist, uh, sentimentalism. It's not the real thing. We are as Bible-believing Christians and fundamentalists. We're accused of not being loving. <clears throat> I've heard this many times on talk shows where I've appeared to do on different subjects and talk about my books and so forth. I was on one talk show and uh, about at the end of the show and we were, we were discussing either homosexuality or the death penalty. I've done hundreds of shows, national and regional, on those issues. And the talk show host said, Dr. Boys, you fundamentalists feel strongly about issues like we're discussing tonight. But you don't really love people. Why is that? That you don't have any concern and compassion and love for people. And I knew what he had done. It only had a matter of seconds. And the red light was going to go out. And he had only made the statement of the accusation. And so I yelled at him, No, you're wrong. The light was still on. So at least I was able to tell everybody the star was wrong. And I went on. I said, The fact is, we Christians, we fundamentalists are the ones who do show love. And because we have strong opinions, and we're unflexible, inflexible about these principles. People think it's a sign of, of meanness. It's not. It's simply a commitment to truth. And I said, we're the ones that send our children to the mission fields of the world. And don't see our children and our grandchildren for four or five years. Modernists don't do that. I said, we're the ones that bring children into our, into our churches. Uh, and they, sometimes they mess up the pews and all that. Modernists don't do that. I said, we're the ones who, who raise great sums of money to start churches around the world and missions programs around the world and medical missions around the world. The modernists don't do that. I said, what happened just recently? Just recently, money was given to the National Council of Churches by mainline denomination here in America, and that money, that money went to blow a civilian airliner out of the sky and buy Claymore mines to blow up civilian buses in Zimbabwe. I said, our money goes to the rate sums that we give freely to win people to Christ and build churches and help people with medical problems. The liberals don't do that. I said, no, we fundamentalists are the ones who do love. And then the light went out, and it was too late for them to say anything else. But we show our devotion to how we love and how we live. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. 
and we're to keep our commandments and our commitments to Christ. Daniel was a man who was determined. He had purpose as a young man, and he kept his commitment all his life, and died way up past 80s, and not one negative thing is said about him. Not that he lived a perfect life, but nothing, not one negative thing is recorded in the Bible against Daniel. And if Daniel can live for God in the wicked administration of Nebuchadnezzar and the wicked pagan administration of Darius, anybody can. Dare to be a Daniel. Dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose for him and dare to make it known. Dare to be a Daniel. Let's pray, please. Father, I want to thank you tonight for the life of Daniel. I want to thank you for his example of his life. And Lord, it eliminates all of our excuses why we can't live for you and can't make an impact. Help us to realize that uh, we are making an impact whether we know it or not, good or bad, every day of our lives. Help us have principles, precepts, and practices that honor you. Help us, Lord, not to listen to the wailing of the world and the complaints. And help us not to identify with backslidden and weak Christians. Help us to be people that we ought to be, because one of these days we'll stand before you and give an account as to how we've loved, how we've lived, how we've served. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Dr. Boyce. And that is a good way to close with the hymn, Dare to Be a Daniel. We're back in the inspiring hymns. If you'll turn to number 456, we'll sing all four verses, 456, Dare to Be a Daniel. I will stand to sing. <laughs> 